Well, good morning again. My name is Murray. So one of the pastors here at Grace Saskatoon and glad to have you with us. And so Mark's been interning with us for two years. So this is his second opportunity to preach before us on a Sunday. So we're excited about that. And it's a joy for, for me to journey this. There's a, a lot of hours have gone into this. Mark can tell you exactly how many hours that have gone into the, just the study of this passage, really, and just the, the preparation and then just the walking through it. So it is a, is a journey, but one of the hearts of what we want to do is Jesus calls to make disciples. And so we want to be able to do that, and so it's a joy to have that. And, and Mark, I think, initially was thinking maybe one year, maybe two years of interning. He wanted to be able to just grow, to have that time of focused discipleship. But he decided that it's a bit of benefit enough that he's going to continue. So he's going to step into year three of the internship, so we're glad uh, for that as well. But I just want to pray for you, brother. just want to thank God for you. And just it's been a joy to just journey this uh, this last couple of years and look forward to what God's got in store for us this this coming year. So, Father, just again, has already been prayed. We've been praying for Mark already. I just pray that you'll just calm his nerves, that, that Lord, he realizes he's among friends here. He's among brothers and sisters who love him. And the focus isn't him anyway. Lord, just help help him to point us to you. Uh, that's his heart desire. That's our hope is you. Um, and so we just pray he'll accomplish the things that he desires through this this message and that lord that you would accomplish your desires that you have for us individually as we uh, hear what you have to say for us hear this not as words may we hear this not as from words of mark uh, to us lord it's just words of inspiration but rather we hear it truly as words from you because you are the one who's behind the words of this psalm and you know what we need you know our brokenness and we know um, you know how much we need you and and we st- need to realize that more and more each and every day. So thank you for my brother. Just, uh, Lord, look forward to this time now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. okay. Thank you, Murray, for that introduction. And I just want to thank everybody in here, right? Because it is, to me, it's really a special place that we get to, um, I get to be up here and I get to come here and preach the word to you. And um, we have a team of, of individuals that help speak into this and help to, to, to build young people that desire to, to come and bring the, Lord, the word of the Lord to you. And, and so I'm just thankful for all of you. And so as Murray said, my name is Mark Halliday, and it's really good that I'm here and I have, have the opportunity. And I just want you to remember those words to that song that we'd sung, right? Your sins may be many, They may be great, they may be many, 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 but his mercy is more. And that is just, that has been playing in my mind for weeks as I've been preparing this message. His mercy is more, but don't forget it. So today we're going to continue in the Psalms, and we're going to look at what the Lord is going to reveal about himself and our continual need for him through Psalm 40. And I have been really refreshed and very much enjoyed putting this message together. And I'm excited now to be up here and to be sharing with you guys about this character of the Lord that I just found so much hope and joy in. So I want to start by asking a question. And that is, have you ever felt trapped in life? And I don't mean like being in a cave or something like that. Like that's terrifying, right? But this is more in a figurative or the literal sense, right? Like or more of the figurative sense, sorry. Maybe life was going well. You were, it was easy for you to be singing praises to God about what he's done for you. And then suddenly you feel like you're spinning out of control in a whirlpool. And maybe you're still in that place right now. Maybe you've dug yourself a deep pit and you're stuck. You just hope and pray that someone will come and rescue you. And maybe there's a particular sin in your life. You have shame from that. And it's keeping you feeling low. You're like, I, don't, I can't ask God to forgive me for this. Like, God is holy, right? I'm not worthy at all to be in his presence. And while that's true, we on our own are not worthy to be in his presence. Do you know that God thinks about you? We heard that a couple weeks ago from Caleb when he preached on Psalm 8. Right? He said, God is mindful of us. Just think on that for a second, right? God who created everything, who sustains everything, keeps everything going, thinks about us. And not only a little bit, right, here and there, but his thoughts are more than we could count. 
one only thinks about someone that much when they truly and deeply love them. And this shows us just a glimpse of how loved we are by our Father. So we're going to have our scripture reading. Neil's going to come up, and then we're going to get into reading about this character of the Lord that I just hope will be refreshing for our souls. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I will delight in your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Naha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. So I'll pray. Lord, I just ask now that as we get into this word, this word that is about you, that you wrote, Lord, that you will just speak through me, and Lord, that your name will just be lifted up and glorified here now. So Father, I pray you'll use this time, bring refreshment to all our souls, O Lord. In your name we ask, amen. So I asked in the introduction if you had about feeling stuck or about going through some type of difficulty. And I'm sure that the majority of us can think of a time or two in our lives where we felt this way. But my question now is where do you first turn when you're in this situation, right? Do you have this natural inclination to solve the problem yourself? Or do you try to pass the blame off, right? It's your boss's fault. That's my first one to go through, right? If only I would have gotten that raise or that new position. Or you blame your spouse. It's their fault. And one of our favorite ones, obviously, is the government. If we could just have a change in government, everything would go so well. Or you blame yourself for where you got. You get yourself feeling low, deep down. Or even God, right? This situation, he put me into it. It's his fault. This psalm, which is written by David, is one where it seems that he's gotten himself into some type of difficulty. Maybe it's one of his own making, or it's the result of others sinning against him. And that's not clear from the text. And I think that that is by design, actually, in this text. Because what happens if you... If we had this situation, we would end up being fixated on the situation and not on where we're to turn or what God has done. But this text is very clear about one thing. It's where David turns. 
See, in the first five verses, it shows us that David turns to the Lord. See, he leads this psalm with remembering what it is God has done for him in the past. Right? Verse 1, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. See, there's that response that we are all so good at. No one here, I can tell, no one here has any trouble waiting patiently for the Lord. I do, but none of you guys all skip that part. So David doesn't jump to blame, but instead he waits patiently. And this is a sign of trust in his heavenly father. See, he remembers that the Lord heard him in the past. And look then what he says in verse 2. He says, He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. See, the Lord didn't leave him. He doesn't leave us in our situations, right? We may have gotten ourselves into a mess that's left us stuck, but the verse tells us that our Father brings us up out of the pit, that we are stuck in and sets our feet on the rock. Have you ever been walking in a mud puddle, right? Your your boots or your shoes get stuck, and every step you take just gets heavier and heavier. I remember a time I had to do a field visit for work, and just before we got there, it rained like two inches or something. It rained a lot, and the field was so sticky, and we had to walk through, and every step, just got heavier and heavier. And then when we were done, you get on this path and it's just so light. You're walking and the mud just flies off your shoes. And I think that's what David is likening the feeling here of when the Lord has removed him from the mire. See, the Lord's heart towards his people is soft and tender. His desire is for our best right? He wants to help us out of the pit. God is not like, you know, you got yourself here into this mess. You figure it out. Get out. He's like, no, I'm going to come into the pit with you. He doesn't leave us stuck there in our situation. He then lifts our feet and sets them on the rock. See, this is what I think walking through the miry clay of life is like. Heavy, slow steps leaves us feeling tired and weighed down. And David acknowledges what his state was like here at the beginning of this passage, right? He was stuck in miry clay, but now his feet are on the solid rock. And before I knew Jesus too, I was on that path. I was stuck in clay. I was headed toward the pit of destruction. But now my feet are secure on the rock that is Christ. And that rock is moving nowhere. He put a new song in my mouth. David continues in verse 3. He says, A song of praise to our God. Many will see and will fear and put their trust in the Lord. Look at David's response in verse 3 to this, right? He sings. His feet are now secure. He's no longer trapped in that pit of destruction. He is shouting praises to his delivering God, publicly declaring what it is God has done for him. You get this sense of lightness, of freeness, of life. He's been released from where he was. And he continues, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud or go astray after lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. This is a man who is just so in love with what his father has done for him. Listen again to these words. Your wondrous deeds, your thoughts towards us, none can compare with you. God, the creator, the sustainer of everything, right? The one who's holy, the one who's righteous. He knows all things, everything even about us. I could go on and on. He thinks about us. And not only sometimes, right, but if I tried to recount back all the thoughts he's had, I couldn't. In Psalm 139, it says his thoughts are more than the sand of the sea. I have seen how much sand my kids dump in the van after going to the beach. I can't count that. 
And that's only a little bit, right? That's the type of thoughts he has for us. And this is just a glimpse into who our Father is. Think about that, that thing in your life or that person, right? Maybe a loved one, a child. You care about them just so deeply, you cannot stop thinking about them. It keeps you awake at night. This is what our Father is like towards us. Even when we ignore Him or we sin against Him, He thinks on us and desires the best for us. And it's wonderful, you know, that we love Him, right? We get to sit here and sing praises to Him and how great is that, but how much more amazing it is that God loves us the way He does, right? And because I think if it doesn't blow you away, your thought of who God is is maybe a little small, right? Because if he's as big and powerful as he is and yet thinks on us, that is remarkable, right? And how does this truth not make us sing and jump for joy, right? It does for David when we realize what Christ has done for us. Our tune changes. We no longer should be troubled to despair of this situation we're currently in but instead call out to God with praise and remember his faithfulness to us in the past. This will give us hope in the present. See, our Father wants us to trust in him, to wait patiently for him. And as verse 4 reminds us, our joy and our blessedness is found in trusting him. So patience is not a virtue in the world today, it would seem. We want everything fast. And our temptation is to turn as fast as we can to a new solution or another solution to solve our problem, right? Or we quickly believe what we read or we hear from some expert with a PhD on the internet. But the Lord says, trust in me and remember what I have done. So looking back through these first five verses David is clear about something, right? He may have gotten himself into a mess, but he takes no credit for getting himself out of it. What does David say about his own actions here? He says, I waited patiently and I proclaimed. Right? That's it. Where does David give the credit to? His delivering God. He says... He inclined to me. He drew me up. He set my feet. He put a new song in my mouth. And note, none of these terms are he will. In these verses, these are all past tense. It's been done. It's delivered. He's delivered. If you're a follower of Jesus, then our feet, like David's, are on the rock. And this is important because when we rightly see who we are, in need of saving, and when we also have the right understanding of the tenderness of the Lord's heart and that his desire is to free us from the miry clay and restore us to him, we can sing a new song and exalt his name. So these first five verses show us that David was delivered out of the miry clay and is now just praising the name of his deliverer. But how did God rescue him from the mire? And as Charles Spurgeon said, these next verses, 6 through 8, are some of the most wonderful verses in the Old Testament. A passage in which the incarnate Son is is seen not through glass darkly, but as if we're face to face. So let's see what these verses tell us. Verse 6, it says, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. So the Old Testament required continual offerings and sacrifices be made for sins. I don't want to get into all of that here at this time, but the sacrificial system made clear that payment was required for sin. But it also pointed to something far greater that would come. And these verses highlight that the Lord's desire was not for us to religiously continually come and bring sacrifices and offerings over and over again to make payment for our sins, but that something greater and far more valuable would come and bring that payment. 
And in verse 6, he says, my ears you have opened. So I don't know if David was deaf or was not able to hear, but suddenly he could hear. But I don't think that's exactly what he was what is trying to be said here. I think this is actually a reference to something far deeper meaning. See, in Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6, it's described that if a slave wanted to permanently belong to their master, they would bore a hole in their ear, signifying their love to their master. This would become the mark of a bond or a love slave. So the slave had paid their debt, And they could go free if they chose. But because of love for their master, they would choose to stay with them as a bond slave. And I think what David is saying is that because the love that his master, or God the Father, showed towards him, David will bore a hole in his ear to stay by his father's side. And then he continues in verse 7. It says, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. So we see these words in verses 7 and 8 are in quotation. So who is it who's speaking? Right? David wrote the psalm, but is the whole scroll of the book written about David? Or is it someone else? And the writer of Hebrews helps us to interpret this as Jesus speaking. See, the Father was, see, the will of the Father was not for us to continually bring sacrifices and offerings, but instead, Hebrews says, a body was prepared for me, for him. His son would come to earth and offer himself as sacrifice once and for all. And the whole Bible, it just has this continual theme, right? In the volume of the scroll of the book, it is written of me. And that includes this psalm. And look at the words in verse 7. It says, Behold, I have come. And here we just get into the meat of who our Father is. So he didn't just send anyone for this mission, right? He didn't just hire some guy from the street so he could stay up in his majestic throne. This work was far too important to be done by anyone but himself in the form of his own son. And there's a story I like to read to my children. And in the story, there's a princess who's adopted by the king. And she desires to know what her life would be like had she not been adopted. And she ends up being lured into this life and into the forest by these lowlanders. And she becomes trapped there. And a young knight suggests to the king that he would go and save the princess. But the king says, no. He himself will go because only he can complete this mission and offer himself as sacrifice. And I love this little story because the king's heart for his adopted daughter, the one who now had resigned her life to living in the forest, with these forest people, and she did so on by her own will, is so great that only he can go himself to get her back. And how it is with God, right? See, his love for us is just so great that only he can go and fulfill this mission. But we now, being on the other side of the cross, know that he came and he completed the will of his Father. See, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 5 through 9, quotes this psalm. And then in verses 9 and 10, there, he says, He, being Jesus, does away with the first, the sacrifices and offerings that were done in the Old Testament, to establish the second. A new covenant is established by the will of the Father. And by that will, we have been sanctified. And notice the tense there, right? Being sanctified, it's in the past. Meaning we've now been set apart and we're with him. Right? And the will of the Father has been completed. And the Hebrews writer continues, it's done through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So sacrifice and offerings from us were of no delight for God. Then Christ comes, as was foretold in the writings of the book, 
the Old Testament writings, and now from the Hebrews writer, we understand We understand that through one sacrifice, the will of the Father has been completed, meaning payment for sin has been made and our relationship with the Father has been restored. And there's a difference between what's written in Psalm 40 and what's quoted in Hebrews 10. I don't know if you could catch it. It says, but it doesn't say that his ear was opened. Instead, it says, a body was prepared for me. See, Christ didn't just get a hole bored in his ear, right? He had one in his side. He became the greater love slave for us. So we've established that Christ is obedient and he came willingly out of love for his master, the perfect bond slave. But look at what it says next in verse 8. He says, I delight. See, he knew what was before him. He knew that he was going to the cross to suffer and to die, and yet he chooses to write the word delight. Right? So Christ came cheerfully from his palace throne to die. Nothing would be too low for him if it meant our rescue. And there's a bit of a heart check for me here because do I delight when I get to sacrifice for others? Like, do I delight when I get to lull my crying baby back to sleep at 2 a.m.? You can guess. And how is it possible that Christ can delight in coming to be our mediator with God and sacrifice for sin, knowing the pain he would need to endure? I think the second part of verse 8 gives us the answer. It says, your law is within my heart. See, he says much of the depth of this, I think, is lost to us in the translation because the word heart in the original Hebrew is translated in the midst of my insides. See, this is who he is. In the deepest part of his insides, of his, of his being, he delighted to come and be a sacrifice. Not, I think, in the actual sacrificing act, but his delight is in the joy that it would accomplish, right? Freeing us from our sin. And Thomas Goodwin, an old British pastor from the 1600s, parallels this love to which God puts in the hearts of parents to love their own children more than other children. See, even when the other children are smarter or they're better looking or they're better athletes, it doesn't matter because those children are our own and we have this special love for them. Just like Christ has this special love for us, a love that compelled him to go through intense sufferings for us. And that law that compels him to come, what is written in his heart is described in Colossians 3.12. It says a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Right? Don't all these characteristics just perfectly describe Jesus? And this is the love that compelled him to come to earth. And this, this is also the love that begins to flow from our own hearts when we understand what we have experienced from him, right? As believers, um, once we realize what Christ did for us, then the transformation in our own heart begins to take place. And those things that are described in Colossians 3.12 start to flow out of us. When this happens, I think then we start to truly love and we get to delight in sacrifices, even those small sacrifices for others, right? Because now that 2 a.m. lulling the baby to sleep, for me, although I don't enjoy it, I still get to delight because I'm sacrificing to let my lovely wife sleep, who has already sacrificed so much. And John Flavel, another Puritan preacher from way back, writes that your delight and your readiness in the paths of obedience is the very measure of your sanctification. And what he's saying here is that as we grow to be more like Christ, our sanctification, we delight more in our obedience to him. And as we continue to reflect and remember like David does at the start of this psalm, that this wonderful grace and mercy that was extended to us, our delight and our obedience becomes greater and greater. 
And I think then it starts to flow out of us, right? We want to pierce our own ear open to signify that we are his bond slaves, his love slaves. We don't ever want to leave the side of our master. David just gets even more excited here. Look, verses 9 and 10, he says, I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. David proclaimed this greatness of his delivering God, right? He just cannot stop singing these praises for what his father has done to him. He's proclaiming it everywhere in the great congregation. Everything sounds so good, right? His feet are on the rock. He has a new song in his mouth, proclaiming the wor- to the world what God has done for him. And he continues in verse 11. He says, As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. Church, listen to these words again. He says, you will not restrain your mercy from me. The Hebrew word used here for mercy is rakem. And it's it's actually a feminine noun for the word the womb. Okay, and it's often used to describe compassion or tenderness. So think of a womb that is tenderly supporting the life of a tiny the tiny life of a baby until it's ready to enter the world, right? The womb just cannot help but support this this growing baby inside of it. That's what it was meant to do. And think just of our father, his soft and his tender mercies towards his children. And I think the New King James in its translation is a little bit better able to capture this word. It translates verse Uh, Verse 11 is saying, do not withhold your tender mercies from me. And when I think we have this right understanding of who our father is, the heart of him, the same heart that compelled Christ to delight in coming to sacrifice and do the father's will, we know how tender and how soft those mercies are towards sinners, right? He showed us. Have you ever experienced those mercies? I know I have, right? They weren't deserved at all. And you almost like you barely have to ask for it. You just look and turn to him. And he's like, my child, come here into my arms. Your sins are great, but my mercy is so much more. Right? Life must be so good for David here, right? He's got this Christian life figured out. Did you hear these first 11 verses? Like he's just, like he's on the rock, he's singing praises, he's got it all figured out. My feet are on the rock, where's my new song? Why does it sometimes still feel heavy to walk? Why do I conceal what it is that the Lord has done for me? I mean, am I even a a Christian? You guys probably don't ever have those thoughts, but I have those thoughts sometimes, right? And David continues in verse 12. He says, For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, ah, ah. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Okay, what's going on here, right? Life seemed way better for David if we just stopped at verse 11, right? Everything was perfect. He was safe in those tender mercies of the Lord. How can this be? He says, evils have surrounded him beyond number. 
His iniquities, which is a word that can be translated, sin is more than the hairs of his head. I don't know if David was bald or how much hair, but it seems like he had a lot because he says he can't see from the the hairs of his head from his sins. His heart fails him, he says. Have you ever been there? You ever been scared of what's happening all around you, all the evils in the world? You can't see where you're going in life. You doubt if you're even a Christian because the thoughts you've had or the things that you've done, and maybe you've even hurt those in life who are closest to you. And shouldn't David be walking around with his chest puffed up, a bounce in his step because of what, who he is? He's the most powerful ruler of all time. He has all the money, he has all the fame, all the power, everything he could want. That's what culture would tell us anyway. This should be the happiest man in the world, right? But instead, he's begging God to deliver him. He is a poor and a needy man, by his own words. But I think this is a man with a bounce in his step. He said so in verse 2 and 3, right? He has a new song in my mouth. But his joy, his new song, it doesn't come from the power or the fame. None of those things that are so sought after by the world could have released him or us out of that miry clay. But what does release David? It's the tender mercies extended from his father. See, David is a man who at this moment acknowledges who he really is. He's a sinner. By his own words, he says, my iniquities have overtaken me. And he is in desperately in need of those tender mercies that his father, that he's pleading to his father for. But see, David has been delivered. Remember all that past tense language from verses one through five, but yet he needs delivering again. This is how it is with the Christian life, right? Though we have been delivered, like David, our feet are on the rock. It's not going to move. We need delivering again. But David has hope, right? He says, yes, I am a poor and a needy man. And just just like us, but look at what comes after that. He says, the Lord takes thought of me. Isn't that just so freeing? I can be poor and needy. I don't need to try and be anything other than that. And the Lord still takes thought of me. See, David's hope, though, thing that keeps him from falling deep into despair are the words that were spoken in verse 7. Behold, I have come. And remember what else it said in verse 7. It said, the whole scroll of the book was written about me. So when we read this psalm as if Jesus is speaking, we see that he willingly, out of love, left his throne And he came into the miry clay with us. He lifted us up out of the pit of destruction. He came and freely took on the form of a bond slave for us. And he did not just have a whole board in his ear, but in his hands and his feet and his side. He was surrounded by evils, right? People seeking to destroy him. And they put him up on a cross. And up on the cross, he takes ownership for our sin. See, those iniquities we read about in verse 12, when we read about Jesus saying that, those are my iniquities, he says, that was my sin. But on the cross, Jesus says, it's mine. Those are my iniquities. I will gladly pay that for you. And Jesus became poor and needy as he hung on the cross. But the Lord took thought of him and lifted him out of the miry pit of destruction when Jesus was raised on the third day. Maybe you're hearing these words, right? I'm talking a lot about tender mercies extended to you. And you don't believe that the Lord can or the Lord will extend those same mercies toward you. You're buying into the lie. You know, maybe you're like, well, I didn't write a whole bunch of Psalms. God didn't select me to be king over Israel. But if you know your scriptures and you know who David is, 
He was a poor, needy man. His sins were great. His sins were many. And yet, the Lord was pleased to deliver him. And he wants to deliver you too. It's his delight. His mercy is more. He's looking upon us with tender compassion. Sinners with the only way to be freed as if he came, and so he did. He came preaching the good news of his father's deliverance, of his father's faithfulness and his father's steadfast love. And he did so right up to the cross. And even while he hung on the cross in pain, something we, I don't even think we can begin to understand. And you think there he could just have this moment kind of to himself to focus on the sacrifice thing he's doing for all of us. But he still shows compassion to poor sinners. Look at what it says in Luke's gospel recording. See, he's pleading to the Father for the people's forgiveness because they don't know what they're doing. And these are the people that put him up on the cross. Right? What love he has for his enemies. And then he tells a criminal that he'll see him in glory. See, the tenderness and compassion of our Lord has no bounds. It's there for you. And it's important for us to remember that God has delivered us, right? It's done. This helps us to keep us from being trapped in a cycle of blame, of doubt, or victimization when we go through trials today. See, the Christian life is one that has been delivered, but needs continual delivering and a continual correction of our thinking back to what it is that he did for us, humbling ourselves. So even if your life feels like it's a mess, I mean, maybe it is, and that's okay, right? If you're a Christian, you've been delivered, and Jesus knows that your life is a mess. Murray used a great illustration a couple weeks ago of likening us to a used car that Jesus buys. And this idea is just weaved all through Scripture, right? Just look at the book of Hosea. It's just one place. We see the, word of, the words of like, I am betrothed to you, right? So, so Jesus knows what he was buying. And Thomas Goodwin, again, to quote him, he says, the idea of your beauty, which God ordained for you from eternity, is so permanently imprinted on his heart that he will never stop sanctifying and cleansing you until he has restored you to that beauty that he wants for you. See, Jesus may have bought a lemon of a vehicle, but he is in the process of restoring these lemons back to the beauty that they were meant to do, to be. And this is written on his heart to do it, right? He, and it's that that con continues to compel him to do this for us. And it may hurt sometimes. But as the text today says, he is faithful to complete it, right? What a savior we have. And we, like David, are poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought of us. And we have been delivered by the one who chose to become poor and needy for us. We would still be trapped in that pit of destruction if he didn't. But our feet are now on the rock that is Christ. And like David, we are continually in need of those tender mercies from our delivering God. But God's mercies, his steadfast love and his faithfulness will preserve us because he has come. This compels us to just sing praises to him. Let's pray. Father, I'm really thankful, God, that you chose to come yourself for us. I'm thankful for what you did on the cross and thankful that even though I am a poor and needy man, Lord, you take thought of me. Father, I just thank you for who you are. Amen.